Well, greetings to you all and trust the Lord is blessing you and encouraging you this week. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity of uh, invading uh, your little meeting from far away Starkville and thank the brothers for the opportunity. And uh, the topic that we've been given is the subject of good works and especially how good works affects our fruitfulness. And I suppose we could take as the purpose of our talk uh, the words of Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25 and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching the word good used in the term good works is a lovely word the word kalos it means beautiful valuable virtuous honest worthy and uh, the new testament is chock full of instructions encouragements to do good works and instructions on how to do good works uh, there are various categories described for example alms deeds the king james has it um, the the word actually is literally compassionateness uh, having a a heart a desire to help those in need uh, it's distinguished from good works as we see in the case of Dorcas in Acts 9.36 where we read that she did both good works and alms deeds. Uh, alms deeds of course focusing primarily on the poor. Uh, there's hospitality especially um, for strangers and those who can't invite themselves back again. Uh, for visitation in prisons and the sick the Lord said I was sick and you visited me I was in prison and you came to me and then uh, visiting the widows and orphans which James says is uh, true religion and protection of the vulnerable so there are many many scriptures and right from the uh, Sermon on the Mount in which the Lord Jesus instructs his people not only to do good works but as to how to do them and one of the things he emphasizes is don't do them so you'll be seen by men because of the university in town here, there's a lot of charity work that goes on here. But uh, sadly, I have to tell you that almost all of it is done so that they might be seen of men. I remember on one occasion, um, the fire department had been given a derelict house that had been trashed in a government housing project. And uh, they fixed it up very nicely. The firemen worked very hard and redid the bathroom, redid the kitchen and so on. Uh, so that uh, people who were burned out of their home in the middle of the night could be taken to this place uh, and have a, a little apartment home uh, to stay in for a few days until they got adjusted. And um, they didn't have any furniture or um, decorations, wall hangings and so on. And so I had the privilege of furnishing the house and included in that was a Bible and a children's Bible and some nice mottos on the wall and also a box of my gospel CDs, A Hope in the Storms of Life. Well, I was invited to the opening, and when I arrived there, uh, the, all the firemen were there, and, and they had the ones who had worked on it. And, and uh, then when the photographer arrived, uh, almost magically, all of these cars started to pull up, and there was the mayor and the councilman and everyone else all gathering in the photos, and uh, the firemen were completely left out. And so as, I, as they were taking the photo, I walked around and I, I talked to various of the firemen and I said, so what did you do here? Well, I replaced the floor in the bathroom or I redid the kitchen sink or whatever it might be. All these people who actually did the work, none of them showed up in the photographs. And uh, I shared with them the scripture that um, the Lord Jesus is coming back in glory. And the scripture says that when he appears in glory, we who have served him will appear with him in glory. I said, you know, when the president gets his picture in the Rose Garden, he doesn't say, wait, wait, hold it. Let's get uh, the, the fellow who shines my shoes and the lady who makes my breakfast. Let's get them all in the picture too. But the Lord Jesus is going to see to it that those who have served him unselfishly with not any interest of getting glory on earth, that he will see to it that they are rewarded in a day to come. So our good works, we discover from Scripture, they ought to be Christ-like because that's what he did. The Scripture says he went about 
doing good. And uh, in fact, he used his good works as an apologetic. Uh, when they came to him in opposition, he said to them in John chapter 10 and verse 32, many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? And he was underlining the fact that when we do good works, uh, we gain uh, visibility and credibility even with those who are opposed to the gospel. They may not like our gospel, but they like our good works. And then secondly, uh, good works are an out outgrowth of the fruit of the Spirit. You know, when we think about uh, being motivated by love, 1 Corinthians 13 comes to mind. The scripture tells us there that um, suppose I did all the good works, even to the point of giving my own body away, it would be nothing if it wasn't motivated by love. And so it's very important for us when we think about the outgrowth of the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and so on, these should be manifested in our works. We should be happy, not grudging, in our doing of good works. And then thirdly, good works should be manifesting the character of the Father. Uh, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, and um, when we do good works, uh, the scripture says the Lord Jesus told his disciples, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In other words, they will make the connection. They'll understand that you are representing God. Some time ago I took some school supplies to a, an elementary school and the secretary came around and she said, um, the principal isn't here right now and um, uh, I'd like him to know uh, who it was that brought these good things. And I'm afraid we don't know your name here. We just call you the man from God. And I said, well, that's good. You just put that on the note. I said, I'm just the delivery boy. This isn't from me. God didn't have a pickup truck, so he asked if I'd use mine. But this is all from him. You don't kiss the delivery man when he brings something good. You recognize that it comes from someone else. And I want you to, if you feel gratitude, I'd like you to thank the Lord. Well, I was asked specifically to focus on Titus uh, chapters 2 and 3, but I'd like to begin at the end of chapter 1 where we read the following. To the pure all things are pure. This is verse 15. To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified from every good work. That's verses 15 and 16 of chapter 1. So the first thing we notice is that our works will distinguish us from the hypocrites. Lots of people talk, but who actually does? And this is one of the things I face in going around and doing good works in the community. People are very jaundiced. They're very uncertain because They've been promised many things in the past that didn't come true. And so we're far better to under-promise and over-produce than the other way around. And uh, so I think it's important for us to realize that, that good works give a sense of authenticity to our message. We say that God cares about people, and does he? A lot of people are strangers to God, but as his local rep, I have the opportunity of showing the love and compassion and care of God to individuals. And if I don't care about their physical needs, if I don't care about their broken hearts, then why should they care about my gospel? Number two, in uh, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, we read, Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Our works should not be occasional events, but a lifestyle. We should have our eyes open to see the needs of people around us. And we notice here that he especially emphasizes young men. Now in other portions, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, he suggests that qualifying widows should be looked upon as blue chip stock. They shouldn't be shuffled off after their husband dies to eke out a living somewhere with a, a low paying job. They should be looked upon as a golden opportunity to invest in the community in good works. And if they have been doing this sort of work in the past, then what we should do 
is uh, help them maybe with a gas card and other supplies so that they can visit in the hospitals, they can visit the young mothers, they can visit um, the sick and so on, the shut-ins. Uh, it's a golden opportunity to use them. The young men are obviously emphasized because they have more energy, sometimes uh, more opportunity, more time uh, to do good works in the community. They should be the front line. The world should see them. That's why the scripture says that older believers should be examples uh, to the believers, to young people, but the young people should be examples of the believers to the world. They should be the front line out there doing good. And then thirdly, uh, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, he says that women are especially strategic in society for good works. And we have people like Dorcas as an example, but there are many others in the New Testament that remind us that uh, the women uh, who are working with the women and children have access to the homes in a, in a way that is much more obvious than uh, the men in the community. Not that the men should not be doing good works, but Paul points out the special and strategic role of women in doing good works. So our first two points, our works distinguish us from hypocrites. And secondly, our works should be a lifestyle, not simply an occasional event. And number three, our works fulfill God's purpose in our lives. This is not a minor thing. We read in uh, chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. You notice the contrast here. He has redeemed us from lawless deeds and he has purified us for good deeds. And this transformation, this remarkable change, will make an impact on our community. But Paul tells about a thief and says that this thief, when he gets saved, becomes a philanthropist. He not only doesn't steal anymore, but he works with his hands the thing that's good so that he might have enough to pay his bills and enough left over to become a philanthropist. What a remarkable transformation. And that's what God wants to do with every one of us, to take us, to turn us from those deeds that are lawless, that are damaging to people, and turn us into agents of good in our communities. You remember the words of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If we are not regularly doing good works, we are not fulfilling one of the grand purposes which God has for us. And then number four, our works require preparation. Preparation both of our resources and of the inner man. Notice what we read uh, in chapter three, Titus three, verses one and two. Remind those who are subject to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Now, when we work in the community, people are sensitive, especially today, hypersensitive about political positions, about uh, racial issues, about uh, moral issues, and we need to walk softly. We need to be careful with this. I remember when I first came down here, uh, I met with two uh, African-American Christians, and I asked them for help because I hadn't really worked a lot in that community. And uh, one of them said to me, well, um, you just have to remember that the three members of the Trinity are Martin Luther King Jr., President Obama and Jesus Christ. If you say anything negative about any of those three, you might as well pack your bags and go home. And I realized that when people asked me about the president, uh, they were testing me. And they wanted to understand if I was sympathetic, if I cared. And instead of passing judgment on his uh, economic policy or his uh, position on, on world government, um, my, my issue was to 
uh, emphasize something in a positive way, as we read here, that I was to be peaceable and gentle and not to speak evil of anyone and show humility. And so to say something like, well, as far as I know, the president is loyal to his wife and he loves his children, and that's a great example. If you're asking me what do I think about his uh, financial policies, I don't even balance my own checkbook. Uh, so I would s slip past that issue, and the scripture says not to speak evil of dignity. Sometimes we, we as Christians become very vocal in issues that undermine our audience, undermine our influence in the community because uh, we've come across as pseudo-politicians or something instead of as ambassadors for Christ. So we not only need to prepare our resources, we read that we are to be ready for every good work. That means I need to have a little cash in my pocket perhaps to help someone on the street. Uh, just last week, uh, an old lady in a beat up car, obviously I think she was living in her car, uh, she stopped me in the Lowe's parking lot and said, sir, w would you have any money to help me buy supper? And um, well, I said, you know, I'd, I'd like a date. If, you, if you'd like to go along with me, I'll take you over to the restaurant and I'll have supper with you. And I was able to share the gospel with her. This dear soul, uh, her family had dispersed, a son had been killed, the daughter was gone somewhere, and she was all alone in the world, uh, named, a lady named Connie, if you think to pray for her. And, and we realized that uh, if we're going to be effective, we have to have resources. We need to uh, know where is the crisis pregnancy center in town? Do I have the phone number for the women's shelter, for the homeless shelter? Uh, do I know where there are resources in town to help people in need? And so we need to be prepared and ready for every good work, and we need to have our hearts prepared, that we come in humility. It's, uh, we've, we've turned the word charity into a bad word in many people's minds because we reach down to people instead of getting down to people and humbly ministering. I'll never forget hearing a story when I was in India uh, the folks in this village told me when the British missionaries first came here, uh, they were very poor as far as the British were concerned, but they were very rich as far as we were concerned. And if they had come to our doors, we would have felt obligated to invite them in. And they would have seen how desperately poor we were. We had nothing to give them, even a little food. And uh, we would have been so ashamed we could never could have looked them in the eye. And so. Um, the missionaries arrived and, and they called into our home and said, uh, could we use the shade of your tree to have our lunch? And we said, yes, they could. And then they said, you know, we really brought too much food just for ourselves. Would you come out and share, uh, help us eat this food? And they said, we loved them because we knew what they were doing. They were providing an opportunity on an equal level to minister to us without reaching down and humiliating us. And so we need to be humble towards all men. And then we discover that number five uh, in chapter three, verses eight and nine, Paul writes, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Again, we need to be focused. We need to understand that we're not going to be distracted by issues. We'll have someone come to our book table and ask us, what do we think about homosexual marriage? We have to decide, are we going to try and win an argument or win a soul? We'll say, well, you know, if you want to talk about uh, a particular sin. Maybe we should start with mine. I'll tell you how God saved me. And maybe in your own heart you'll see that you have things that you need to be saved from. If you need to be saved, there's only one Savior, and that's the Lord Jesus. And to pivot from hot-button issues, in which I probably will do damage in the conversation, and turn people's eyes to the Lord Jesus. And so number five, our works require care to maintain and involve avoiding unprofitable interactions. I think it's so important for us here where he talks about this, being careful to maintain good works. Here's what happens. 
We start off, we go and do something for somebody, and they say thank you. And then the next time they call up and say, hey, where are you? Like, we, we need that stuff. And they start to take for granted your largesse. They maybe don't even say thank you anymore. If you're going to be careful to maintain good works, you have to be doing it for the right reason. You're doing it because the Lord called you to do it. It's a good thing the Lord Jesus didn't wait until we were appreciative before he sacrificed himself for us. And uh, the Lord Jesus fed the multitude. And they came back the next day. I don't know that anybody said thank you. Certainly no one invited him home to stay overnight. But when they showed up the next day, he said, I know what you're here for. You don't want me. You just want my bread. And we're going to find that people will take advantage of us. They took advantage of the Lord Jesus all the time. I take advantage of the Lord Jesus. But he goes on graciously giving. And we need to have that spirit. Otherwise, we'll become uh, cynical and jaundiced. Not everybody's going to appreciate everything you do for them. Well, but the Lord will appreciate it. We have to wait for our thanks. And that's the whole point. The Lord said, are you doing it so men will appreciate it? If so, you have your reward. That's what you wanted. You want a little applause? Good. You want your name in the paper? Go ahead. But if you can do it surreptitiously, if you can do it quietly, unassumingly, humbly, then the Lord said, the thanks is still coming. And then number six, our works are directly linked to fruitfulness. And this is the point the brothers wanted us to underline. In chapter 3 and verse 14 we read, And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. And Paul's closing exhortation to the elders at Miletus, he says, I've shown you in every way, by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, a quotation we can't find anywhere in the four Gospels, but obviously so often stated that everybody knew he was the source of this. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, one of the important things in dealing with good works, as far as I'm concerned, and I learned this from a brother who labored in India and understood the uh, liabilities of doing good works because you're accused of buying converts. And so it's important for us to keep our good works and our good news separate and let the world put them together. If I go into a school and say, listen, I'll bring you supplies if you let me preach, then I'll have a very cold reception. People will give the impression, look, you, you trying to buy me off here? I, I come across as mercenary. And so if I'm going to uh, have this opportunity to minister to people, then I have to be prepared to trust God to open a door for the gospel, not push my way in. This is crucial. And I can tell you this, I could give a hundred stories where I, I began by doing good works with no, no way of connecting the dots, no way of saying, okay, if I do this, then this will happen. Generally speaking, as I'm doing some good work, God will open a door at right angles, as if to say, I can't see how this leads to that, but now I see how God has opened that door. Now, just one example, um, some Muslim international students here needed to be taken to the doctor in Jackson two hours away, and I offered to, to do this. And, took them down and cared for them, took them several times, and uh, they never helped with the gas money or anything like that. I wasn't looking for that. It wasn't the intention. I was happy to do it for them. Took them out for dinner, had opportunities to talk with them. But then one day I got a phone call from um, a gentleman who's the priest, if you will, uh, the imam over at the local mosque. I didn't even know there was a mosque in town. I should have assumed one. But uh, the fact is there was a mosque with a hundred men from 50 Muslim countries right here in our little town of 25,000 people. And uh, this imam said to me, um, the, uh, my Muslim friends, uh, they have seen the light in your face 
and uh, they believe you're a man of God and we want to know what you believe. Will you come as the guest of honor to the feast that celebrates the end of Ramadan? And so I went and uh, after we got our food, we sat around at this big table. Most of these are professors and graduate students, uh, some of the highest level uh, folks from their own countries sitting around the table. And they said, well, now we've got two hours till the evening prayers. Mr. Nicholson, tell us what you believe. And for two hours, I was able to share the gospel with him. It was not my intention. It wasn't my plan. My plan was to show the love of God to these students. And in the end, God opened the door for the gospel. And I can tell you that on every occasion that I was given a legitimate offer to do good works without any hope of having a, a gospel connection, the Lord opened the door for me. And it was clear to them and clear to me that God wanted, first of all, to demonstrate his love to them and then to explain his love to them in the story of Calvary. So may the Lord encourage our hearts to lay claim to this truth. It is more blessed, it's a happier thing to give than receive. Do we really believe that? That by simply giving, not the response of people, not whether they're thankful, not whether they give me any uh, expression of gratitude, but simply in the joy of giving to share the heart of God to reveal the heart of Christ and to manifest the fruit of the Spirit and discover the words of the Lord Jesus are true. It is more blessed to give than receive.